we'd gather to worship, and uh, Brother Phillips will be ministering. Brother Phillips is a spirit-filled Baptist preacher. Boy, is he spirit-filled, and what a powerful word God has given to him. I love him in the Lord. He's been such a blessing to my heart, and you'll not forget him, believe me. You better have your Bibles with you. Don't, don't dare come to a session without your Bible. Like, like uh, Bob says, if you come without your Bible, you came naked. And you've got to have the Word with you. I, I can't tell you the, the burden of our heart for all of the workers, like Teen Challenge workers and other parachurch ministries that are here from all over the United States. And we, uh, Bob has been weeping all day. Yesterday, I had my weeping time. Uh, the Holy Spirit came upon me and made it so very clear to my heart uh, that there was going to be a breaking, but there's also going to be a great time of healing. And some of you need healing. Some of you need healing in your marriage. Some of you need healing in your ministry. Some of you are worn out. You're burned out. You're tired. It's evident here tonight. I can sense that tiredness in many of you. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit that that, that will be taken from you tonight and lifted now, many of you, it may be just a physical thing. Some of it's a spiritual thing. Listen, we're not trying to start a, uh, another camp, you know, uh, uh, a repentance camp. We don't, this is just something God's laid on our hearts. We have these gatherings uh, scheduled now. The Lord's raising up all over the world. Uh, in Poland, we're having some repentance gatherings and then also in Hungary, along with our crusades. And uh, Los Angeles and Toronto and... Georgia and all of the United States. We are praying in the next two years there will be over 20,000 ministers and their wives gathering in these meetings. And that should make some kind of an impact on the church of Jesus Christ. And uh, believe it or not, there are many others that are, are feeling, sensing the Holy Spirit saying the same thing in their churches in various small groups. It's not being done in big ministries. It's not being done in a big way. It's being done in just... Small gatherings like this where people are hungry for the Lord. And I, I know he's prepared my heart, and I want him to prepare your heart to receive the living word. Uh, believe me, it's not just in preaching. And Brother Warnock, when we came in the service tonight, prayed uh, a beautiful prayer that Christ alone be honored, and there'd be a pure word come forward, forth from our hearts, and that the Lord would be honored in it. But I tremble tonight at the responsibility that is ours to unburden our hearts to you. And before I preach, I'm going to introduce a lady here that many of you who are on, my mail, on our mailing list have prayed for many times. No clapping, please. I just want to introduce Gwen to you so that during the conference you can say hello to her and she maybe want to minister to you. Honey, where have you at? Will you stand, please? Uh, Gwen, where are you? Right here. Keep standing. Right here in the middle. Uh, keep standing, honey. So people... All right. Now, this is Gwen, and uh, feel free to go up uh, and uh, say hello to her. She's been healed. No lupus, no cancer, just healed marvelously. And we give the Lord glory and praise for that. Hallelujah. All right, let's get this good word. I want to talk to you tonight about the great apostasy. The great apostasy. Will you go to Second Thessalonians? Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. <clears throat> 2 Thessalonians 2. I'm going to read just one verse there before we get into uh, the message. 1 Thessalonians, please. Uh, no, it's 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians, first, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 1, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Go down with me to verse 3, please. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come, and I'm reading from the New American Standard, it will not come unless the apostasy, in King James, I believe, says falling away, the great falling away or the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. Read it again, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. It will not come until the great falling away first. There's a falling away that precedes the coming of the Lord. Now, if you will, turn to Isaiah, the 30th chapter, and just leave it open there while I pray. 
we're going to we're going to go into a prophecy here in just a moment from the book of I from the prophet Isaiah, a very powerful and profound prophecy for this our day. And uh, I want you to just keep your Bible open to Isaiah 30 while we pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for gathering people from around the United States and from Canada who have come together for one purpose, and that's to open their heart to the light of the Holy Ghost. Spirit of the living God, come forth now with your divine word, with unction and with anointing. Lord, this is not our word, the words of men. We believe that you gave this to us in prayer. We come to you now, Lord, for that special unction and anointing that alone makes the word come to life to our hearts. And we believe, Lord, that if you created the word, if you gave it and brought it forth in the heart, you will send it forth with that unction and anointing that will change our lives. Change our lives tonight, Lord. Let it begin tonight and tomorrow, all day tomorrow and all day Friday, as the word comes as a hammer, as a sword and as a bottle of oil to heal and to open the wound and then to extract the poison. Oh, God, in Jesus' name. Transform our lives. Let no one leave the way they came. Oh God, you know what the need is tonight. Holy Spirit, you know the need of this hour. You know the need of this people seated here right now. You know the need of those hearing this message at this very moment. You've prepared this word for those who hear it now. Send it forth, Holy Spirit, with your unction. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The great apostasy. Now, an apostasy, of course, in the Greek is a falling away, and a falling away is that uh, from which we once believed. It's a giving up of what was dearly held as the truth. So what we're talking about tonight all through this message is the great apostasy or the great falling away. Now, look at me, please. You know, as well as I do from the study of the Scripture, that before the Antichrist re is revealed, there's an Antichrist spirit, a spirit of lawlessness that comes upon the earth. It's called a mystery of lawlessness, and that mystery of lawlessness is already at work in the land. Have you ever wondered why there's so many expose books now about uh, seductions and apostasies in the church? Because there's to uh, be a furious activity of a spirit of lawlessness just before Jesus comes. Satan and the powers of darkness are going to be setting the stage, trying to shipwreck and destroy the faith of many Christians. And the Bible said, because sin will be rampant, the faith of many will grow cold. And many, many Christians are going to be shipwrecked in their faith. Many ministers are going to be shipwrecked in their faith. Now, God's great concern is not so much about what Christians are falling into as what they're falling away from. And that's what I want to deal with you tonight. They're falling away, multitudes falling away, including pastors and deacons and ministry people, are falling away from Christ as the head, beginning to lean on the arm of the flesh, turning away from Christ as being the answer to every need for mankind. They're falling away from that childlike faith that is the solution to every man's problem. There is an absolute wholesale turning away from the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ to the methods of men. All the prophets in this book foresaw this apostasy coming and they cried out against it. And Isaiah has given us one of the most vivid prophecies, and I believe it has to do with exactly with this day. It's about a people who are going to leave their God and go back down to Egypt from which they've been delivered. Go back to Egypt seeking for help. Now, God made mo no mistake about who this prophecy is directed to. And if you turn with me to Isaiah 30, verse 8, I'm going to read to you beyond any shadow of a doubt proof that this prophecy has to do with our time right now. Reading again from the New American Standard. Now go, this is God speaking to the prophet Isaiah. Now go, write it on a tablet before them, inscribe it on a scroll, that it may serve in the time to come as a witness forever. And the little translation is that it may be for the future generations for the latter days. In the original Hebrew, a uh, message for the future generations for the latter days. And the entire 30th chapter of Isaiah is a last day prophecy for you and for me. And I want to deal with it tonight. First of all, the message begins with a revelation of God's grief over the cause of this great apostasy that's coming. Go to verse 1, chapter 30, verse 1. 
Woe to the rebellious children, declares the Lord, who execute a plan but not mine, and they make an alliance but not of my spirit, in order to add sin to sin, who do what? They proceed down to Egypt without consulting me to take refuge in the safety of Pharaoh and to seek shelter in the, in, in the shadow of Egypt. Now look at me, please. Why does the prophet call God's children rebellious? Now that's a strong word. You're a rebellious people. There's introduced a sin, an ultimate sin, in this chapter that is beyond any sin that we've ever named in any of these repentance conferences. It's a slap in God's face. It's a compounded sin. He said it's adding sin to sin. This sin that we're talking about tonight goes beyond drug abuse or alcoholism, adultery, fornication, gambling, homosexuality, fornication, pornography, any sin of the flesh that you name. The sin that the prophet is trying to get to, the, the sin that has grieved the heart of God, so much that he'd call his own children apostates and call them rebellious. It's a sin that is a slap in the face of Almighty God. And he said, it's a sin of going back down to Egypt without consulting me. You've turned away from me as the answer and solution to the problems of life. And you're going back to that very thing that caused you pain and corruption in the first place. You're going back. It's personal indignity against the Holy God. He said, now you're making all your plans without consulting me even. He said, now you're in league with those who lean on the arm of the flesh and not the spirit. You're going back to the very thing I delivered you from. You're going back to seeking help from those who originally caused your grief and your bondage. And I'll tell you something. God's really been dealing with me. If you go to chapter 31 and look at verse 1, go just turn it to, to the page to Isaiah 31, verse 1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. And they rely on horses and they trust in chariots because they're many. And in horsemen because they're very strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. They don't look to Him anymore. Now we're talking about being delivered from the enemy. Now remember, Isaiah is talking about a people who under Hezekiah were being surrounded by the Assyrians. The Assyrians were at the gate. Now, this is, this is something that we've got to deal with right here and now without going any further in this message. We're talking about deliverance. We're talking about an enemy that had not been stopped, was moving over everybody and everything, and now here's this great Assyrian army surrounding Hezekiah, King Hezekiah in Jerusalem. In fact, Assyria means successful enemy in Hebrew. Successful enemy. There had never been a day that Assyria had not had a success. This is an all-powerful enemy. And here are God's people, His elders, His shepherds, His parachurch ministries, if you please. And they're facing a formidable enemy at the gate. And how do you face this enemy? Are you going to trust Almighty God who delivered you from the first out of Egypt? Are you going to trust Him who's had a reputation over the years of coming forth with His strong arm when you needed Him? Are you going to do like Israel and panic? And are you going to gather your leaders and you're going to load your donkeys with presents and silver and gold out of the national treasury? And are you going to go back through that wilderness? You're going to go back to Zoan, the scripture says, and to Hanes, two Egyptian cities, and meet with the leaders of Israel and meet with their generals and ask for their help. And under this panic, and they did it, they tried to do it from under the eyes of both Jeremiah. And remember that Jeremiah and Isaiah... And Ezekiel, all three were contemporaries who at one time were prophesying in Israel. There was a period of about seven years where all three of these prophets were contemporary. And they're trying to hide it from the prophets. They're taking matters in their own hand. And what a picture of emptiness and anguish that Isaiah is painting for these people. He said, if you do that. If you go back through that wilderness through which God delivered you and brought you out of and you backtrack. Listen to what he says. Verse 7. Look at Isaiah 30 verse 7. In fact, uh, go to verse uh, 6. The oracle concerning the beast of the Negev. And, and, and really he's talking about this is a message for the hippopotamus which is Egypt. It, uh, the, the beast there means hippopotamus in Hebrew. Through a land of distress and anguish, from where 
become lioness and lion and viper and flying serpent. They carried their riches on the backs of their young donkeys and their treasures on camel's humps to a people who cannot profit them, even Egypt whose help is vain and empty. Now listen to this. Therefore, I have called her Rahab, who has been exterminated. Now, all right, look at this now. Rahab in Hebrew means, and, and here's, here's the scripture interpreted in original Hebrew. I have called Egypt great mouth. It's called great mouth or a bragging people who have no power. The original Hebrew is great mouth or bragging people. He said, I once delivered you out of great mouth. I brought you out of a bragging world. All they did was brag. There was no power. This is a power who can't move. This is a power that sits idle. And you go back, you're going back through a wilderness of grief and anguish where the lion is, where the viper and where the serpent is. And you show me people who leave their faith in the headship of Jesus Christ and go back and lean on the arm of flesh and all the burnout, the anguish, the despair. And if you, if you read from verse 6 and 7 and 8, and you, you, you'll see clearly he's painting a picture of the anguish and the anxiety that's in the church of Jesus Christ today because we have a people going back to Egypt. Going backwards. Look at the church today. Armies of trained experts, shepherds and Christian workers. Where are most of them headed? They're headed to Freud. They're headed to Carl Ung. They're headed to psychology. They're headed to seminars where they learn how the experts do it. Where they once to pray, once used to pray and seek the face of God and hear from heaven. Amen. Now they know how to do it. They're experts. They have expertise. Where is the church in Jesus Christ headed? Back to Egypt on its donkeys. Swift horses back to Egypt. Back to Great Mouth. Back to the braggart who has no power to move. For this is rebellious people who refuse to listen to the instructions of the Lord. Verse 9. This is a rebellious people who what? Refuse to listen to the instructions of the Lord. All right, now, go with me to Deuteronomy 31. Uh, keep your finger at verse chapter 30. I'm going to come back. We're going to go to the whole chapter. It's a powerful prophecy. And I'm going to share with you something the Lord shared with me this, in the past few weeks. Hopefully. Just ask me, God, give me the courage to share it tonight. I'm not baiting you. Just, I want God to open our hearts. I, Deuteronomy 31. Go to Deuteronomy 31. Deuteronomy 31. Are you keeping Isaiah 30? All right. Put a marker there and go to Deuteronomy 31. Go to verse 26. Moses speaking. For I know your rebellion and your stubbornness. Behold, while I'm still alive with you today. Think of this. He said, I'm still living and you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more than after my death? Assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their hearing and call the heavens and the earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you'll act corruptly. And you'll turn from... The way which I have commanded you and evil will befall you when in the latter days, for you will do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger with the work of your hands. Then Moses spoke in the hearing of the assembly of Israel, the words of this song until they were complete. Listen to what he warned Israel. He said, when I go, you're going to turn away from the ways of God. You're going to have evil befall you in the latter days. If you just go over to Deuteronomy 31, just turn to 31, uh, or rather back to 31, 20. Look at verse 20. <clears throat> For when I bring them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and are satisfied and become prosperous, then they will turn to other gods and serve them and spurn me, spurn me, and break my covenant. Now look at me, please. Now I want to tell you, say something. I want you to listen very closely. We are being destroyed by the very blessings that are a result of our dependence on the Lord. Now let me explain that. You, you, you start out depending on the Lord. He, he saves you from sin. Jesus becomes everything. 
You become totally dependent on the Lord and you walk in that dependence. And that dependence produces a blessing. It produces a flow of divine blessing. I'm not talking about just material blessing. But dependence on the Lord produces something miraculous. And when that miraculous is produced, we begin to be destroyed by the very thing that once made us dependent on the Lord. And God's been dealing with me about that in my life. David, that's the way you started. When I started on the streets of New York, you teen talented workers, listen to me. I had nothing but a little motor scooter. And I scooted all over that city, up and down those streets, and I cried night and day. I wept like a baby. I didn't make a move. There wasn't a prostitute in that city who could look me in the eye without turning aside. She wouldn't dare come near me because there was a holy power of God on me. There wasn't one thing in that city that attracted me. I made no move until I was in that secret closet. And I heard from God. Do this, do that. I laid hands on drug addicts and alcoholics and prostitutes and there were miracles. And that very dependence caused people around the country to sit up and take notice. It began to have a money flow because people were responding to that kind of dependence. And the very thing that dependence created in me began to destroy me. Do you understand where I'm headed? Do you understand what I'm saying? We're destroyed by the very blessings that result from our dependence on the Lord. So you have to keep going back. You have to stop and say that's enough. And you have to go all the way back to the beginning again. Now let's tie it down right now to what the prophet's trying to get at. What does it mean when he says you've spurned the Lord, you're going down to Egypt? How do you interpret it in these last days? God's saying... When I first called you and I touched you and delivered you from the enemy, all you wanted was me. You prayed about everything. Isn't that true? You had a childlike trust and confidence in me, Jesus says. You knew I would guide you, that I'd miraculously supply all your needs. And I was your joy. I was your satisfaction. You didn't get burned out. You weren't confused then. You had a yearning after me. Now you have your books. You've got all your modern methods. You have men to tell you how to write your newsletters now. And I'll tell you, you go to some of these gatherings now where all the, all the experts gather. And it's an abomination to God. At, at one such meeting, they had about 5,000 people at the convention and one of my associates was there. And they were introducing a little machine that signs the letter. The evangelist can sign his name. It says you can sign 50,000 signatures in eight hours. And all these experts standing there giving advice on how to get money from the people. You're supposed to make sure that you don't send any, uh, you don't send any blue envelopes. You don't send any green because that's moody. Certain colors of paper. You have to create crises. You make up crises. And we've got an army now of experts teaching us how to do the work of God. Jesus Christ no longer the center of it. Busily engaged in hard work for the Lord. And it leaves you weary. It leaves you burned out. It leaves you empty because you're on the road to Egypt. I'm going to make a statement and I hope you hear me and I kid you not. When you're moving in the spirit and when you're holding the head and when it means hold the head, it means you retain Christ as the center of everything. You will not get weary. You will not get burned out. You will not get discouraged. There will be an ever increasing light dawning in your heart. I've learned that the hard way. Our churches no longer have the power of God to attract the people in many circles. So they've gone down to Egypt and borrowed its music, its dancing, its entertainment, hoping to get the crowd back. It's not a passion for souls, it's just a passion for crowds. I've got men who hate what I preach, but they'd love to have me because they think I can get a crowd. And they just sit back there laughing at me as long as the church is packed. Church growth at any cost. Look at the average church bulletin. It's like a, a theater package. 
It looks like you're going to a theater. But then, of course, we have parachurch ministries that are falling away too, apostatizing. I grieve when I think of all the teen child's workers and parachurch ministers all across the country parked in front of their TV sets hour after hour after hour with the world going to hell. How, how do you sit there and watch what comes out of the very pits of hell? How do you sit there allowing your spiritual life to just ooze out of you? And I'm going to look you right in the eye and tell you the day has already come that you can no longer keep the anointing of the Holy Ghost and sit in front of your idol. My Bible says, Thou shalt bring no abomination into your house. You shall hate it, you shall detest it, lest you become a curse just like unto it. We've got Teen Challenge workers reading psychology books now. Oh, some of them still want to go out and witness for Christ, but even that's becoming a hype in many circles. Just a hype. Just go, go, go. No dependence on the Lord. N not getting along with God and hearing what the Holy Spirit has in mind, but having a committee meeting and trying to get together. What do you think God is saying? If you're a leader of one of these groups, you should be shut in the secret clause of the Lord. You should come out with it. Thus saith the Lord, where God has spoken to your heart. You have a divine plan from the heart of God. The scripture, or the prophet Isaiah says, this apostasy is going to include a rejection of the message of holiness, judgment, and repentance. Did you hear that? It was a mouthful. I'm going to repeat it. The apostasy includes a total rejection of the message of holiness, judgment, and repentance. Go to Isaiah 30, verse 10. 30, verse 10. If you obey the Lord your God to keep His commandments and His statutes which are written in this book of the law, if you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, for this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you. Am I on the right one? Oh, I'm, I'm still in Deuteronomy. I, I want to go, go, go to Isaiah. Isaiah 30, verse 10. Do you have that? They say to the seers, you must not see visions. And to the prophets, you what? You must not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us. Pleasant or smooth words prophesy illusions. Look at me now. An apostate church wants nothing to do with visions or prophecies of men of righteousness. They don't want anything to do with it. You know that's the gospel. You know that's the truth. They want to hear messages. They, they want nothing that disturbs the status quo. Nothing to upset this successful world in which they move and live. They refuse any kind of correction. Everything today is being excused under the banner of love. Love. We're getting ready to love the devil. This is a perverted love I want nothing to do with. It's all cliches. It has nothing to do with this book. Our people clamor for entertainment. They flock by the thousands now to concerts and plays and social gatherings while they ridicule the prophets. They mock what they call the doomsday preachers and they prefer the illusions. They don't want any preacher or evangelist to tell them the hard truth and they don't want the sword of the Lord to come forth in their congregations. They say, preach to us smooth things. Bless us. Make us happy. Make us feel good. I heard a preacher say, you can come to this church and feel good. God help us. Pastor, if you have a church where people just come to feel good, you're not preaching the word. They especially reject the message of holiness and separation. Verse 11. They say, get out of the way. Turn aside from the past. Let us hear no more about the holy, holy one of Israel. Look at me. I never thought I'd live to see the day that I would have 
letters pouring into my office from Assembly of God preachers, condemning this ministry for bringing confusion and reproach on the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. For what? For preaching righteousness, holiness, and judgment. We're bringing reproach. We're condemning the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. While some of these very men can't fill their church up on Sunday night without a rock concert. They say, no more preaching of this Holy One of Israel. Jeremiah was sent to prophesy against the apostate Jews, the Lord's own people. You know what God said to Jeremiah? He, he said, I send you forth with my word of judgment and holiness and righteousness, but they will fight you. The dread of the Lord is no longer in them. They prefer to drink from cisterns rather than the living water. You go to Jeremiah 1, 2, 3 and you'll find it. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. Don't turn it now, but you'll find that old thing there. God sent it. He said, go, preach to them. But your preaching is going to make their eyes hard. You're going to make them insensitive to the truth. And I'll tell you what, when the word of God comes forth in its power and unction, it'll do one of two things. It'll either break you or harden you. Amen. It'll break you or harden you. It'll judge you. The word will judge you or break you. And I've seen that happen in these repentance gatherings. I've seen the word of God come forth from Brother Bob and some of our other speakers like a hammer. Tomorrow you'll hear the hammer coming down, the word of God. And I've seen people sit there who later confessed they were living in adultery, sit there, grit their teeth. Because they weren't willing to lay down their sin. The word of God was judging them and they were rejecting the word. Let us hear no more of this Holy One of Israel. Turn aside. We don't want you in our churches. Why is it that people are flocking to prosperity preachers? Why is it when you preach prosperity you can draw a crowd simply because it suits the lifestyles of those who gather? They flock to these teachers because they feel comfortable with them because of their world of materialism. They're in no mood to give up anything or to sacrifice or to hear about crosses or losses. They're into buying and acquiring and enjoying and climbing the social ladder. Folks, if that's all I was going to do, if I wanted to, if I wanted to get rich and if I, if I had all these things and I felt condemned, I'd go to a preacher and go set my mind at ease. But when you've got the fire of the Holy Ghost burning in your heart and Jesus Christ is the head, you can't go near it because the fire of the Holy Ghost will burn it out. And I'm going to tell you now, that's a doctrine of devils. I'm not saying at all who preach it are devils, I'm saying it's a delusion. And those who are holy and righteous are going to get out of it before Jesus comes. Or else they're not righteous men. And if you sit here now and you've been preaching that, and even if somebody at God churches are split right down the middle now. Preachers don't know what to preach anymore. If they preach this, they offend this group. If they preach something else, they offend this group. Brother, forget what the people say and preach the holy word of God. An apostate church simply endures the prophetic voice. They pass it by with a condescending smile. I'm going to read to you. Listen to Ezekiel 33. Don't turn, but just listen to it. He said, they come to you as my people come, and they sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they don't do them. For they do the lustful desires expressed by their mouth, and their heart goes after their own gain and their idols. And behold, you are to them like a sensual song by one who has a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. And they hear your words, but they do not practice them. Oh, it, it, it grieves my heart. I, after writing the book, The Trumpet, folks, I spent hours and days and weeks, in fact, months, shut in with God. When the Spirit of God would come upon me, I'd begin to prophesy against the idolatry of television and rock music of devils in our churches. And I could feel the wrath of God against it. And I'd go in the backyard and prophesy to the trees because I didn't think anyone would listen. I'd just raise my voice and prophesy. You've been bringing unclean offerings. You've brought bruised and bleeding lambs to my table and the tables of the Lord are filled with vomit. And I was prophesying and prostrate on the grass and feeling the wrath of God breathing down my neck against it all. And I get up and I bleed my heart out. And I can quote a hundred scriptures against this kind of idolatry. And, and, and people will come up and pat me on the back and say, Good preaching, Brother Dave, I believe it. And go right back that very night and sit and watch filth. 
And it's kind of an amusing message. It's kind of a novel thing to hear someone prophesy now. What's it going to be for you, brother, sister? Is it going to be that you hear the prophetic word of the Lord come? And then you walk out and say it's a sweet, sensual song. And go right back and do the same very thing. As if you were never delivered from your idolatry in the first place. I don't understand how anyone who loves God with all their heart. I don't understand anyone who knows that one day soon they're going to stand before the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't see how you can sit before your idols anymore knowing that you stand before His holy eyes. But they don't do it. They're still going to go about their lustful desires. They love to hear it. They love to say amen. But it doesn't affect them. Just a sensuous song. According to the prophecy of Isaiah, the apostate church of the last day is not going to accept this message of repentance, whether I preach it or any, any other man of God preaches it. It's not going to be accepted by the masses. It's going to be accepted only by a holy, separated view. Isaiah 30, verse 15. For thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel has said, What? In repentance and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and trust, in quietness and trust is your strength. But you were not willing and you said no. You're not willing. You said no. Oh, brother, sister, listen to me. The message of the Holy Ghost to this last day church is that in repentance and rest is your only hope. The only hope left for the church is to return to Him with all their heart and to get out of Egypt and the world. Try to tell that to the modern, huge, multi-million dollar television ministries today. That the only hope is repentance. Tell them that. Tell that to the money-mad crowds. Tell, tell the sensuous, prosperous, self-induced, self-centered generation of Christians... Tell them that their only hope is in repentance. Tell them that. See how many listen. They don't even have time to consider the question, let alone the answer. And not a handful of assembly of God preachers coming to any of our conferences. I'll send out 2,000 invitations and get like we did here, 25 answers. We have about 25 here. No time. No time. I'm not in, I'm, I love everyone. God knows my heart. I love every brother in Christ. And I know many can't come because of, of financial problems and everything. It's not because they're not coming here. But there is not even a note that's saying, I can't come. It's almost, in fact, the input is, why should I come? Why should I even think of repentance? Isaiah says, they will reject the message of repentance. They'll reject the message that in the last day, the thought of quietness and rest and simple trust. No, he said, we want the swift horses of Egypt. Swift horses of Egypt. All right, now, look at me, please. I'm going to... Approach this very uh, cautiously. Because I've, I hear so many prophecies today, they're off the wall. I hear so many saying, God told me, and it's so clearly flesh. And I don't want to be a part of that. But I know that God has to bring a word tonight, and I want to share it with you. Go, go to verse 12. Chapter 30, Isaiah predicts there's going to be a sudden collapse of ministries who reject the message of repentance. Now I want you to look at this. Verse 12, 13 and 14. Therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, since you've rejected this word, you put trust in oppression and guile and have relied on them. 
Therefore, this iniquity will be to you like a breach about to fall, a bulge in a high wall. What? Whose collapse comes suddenly in an instant. And whose collapse is like the smashing of a potter's jar so ruthlessly shattered. Would you look at that again with me for just a minute? Whose collapse comes suddenly in an instant. And whose collapse is like the smashing of a potter's jar so ruthlessly shattered. Now, would you look this way? And I want to look you right in the eye when I tell you from my heart that the Holy Spirit is going to do something very shortly in this land. He's going to start smashing ministries left and right. And some of you that are seated here tonight listening to me, your ministry is going to be shattered like a jar unless you get a hold of God and quit running down to Egypt and get back to the head. God's going to stop the money flow. A week ago, in the middle of the night, I had a visitation in prayer. The Lord didn't appear to me. Just the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart. I can't begin to share everything that I see. But it was stronger than the vision. It was stronger than the trumpet book that he gave me. And I see what Isaiah saw. Isaiah said, this is a message for the latter day. Didn't that, isn't that what he said in verse 8? For a last day people. And in this last day, God is going to shatter ministries left and right. We're on the verge of seeing every major television ministry go down except those who are preaching repentance and those who are righteous before Almighty God. They're going to be gone. In a three-month period, they're all going down. Every one of them. They're going to be churches going bankrupt left and right. Buildings standing empty. In that time, many of those preachers are going to repent. Those banks are not going to want those churches because there's going to be such a tragedy in the land. And those who repent are going to pray, but go back into those churches and use them. And the Lord's going to set them free of that debt for a while. But he said, there's coming a collapse suddenly in an instant. And whose collapse is going to be like the smashing of a part of his jar so ruthlessly shattered. Those who preach prosperity are going to become hated preachers in the land. I am already getting letters 10 and 12 a week from people, especially from the Houston area and other places where the farms are going bankrupt, who are members of congregations that preach nothing but prosperity. And now these people are going bankrupt left and right, and they're going back to the pastors who preached it and said, why isn't it working now? I don't know of any reason why this should happen to me. I have as much faith as I ever had, and there's no sin in my life. Why isn't it working now? And many of them are losing their faith in God. They're turning their back. And we've had letters from people now who have such hatred toward their pastors who preach this message, absolute hatred. And brother, sister, the time is coming soon. When God is going to cut off the finances, there's going to be a bankruptcy, probably of a European nation. They're going to default on their international loans. It could be Poland. Poland owes over $30 billion. They haven't even paid their interest. It's up to $36 billion now because of their interest. Can't even begin to pay it. Philippines can't begin to pay their money back. And I want to tell you something. The moment you see the first country go down that can't pay its international debt, you know that you've got just a few weeks before Mexico goes down. And when Mexico goes down, the panic hits this nation. There's going to be a panic like this nation has never seen. And when that happens, this country will never be the same again till Jesus comes. Never. And all I can do is warn you. That's all I can do. There are going to be people hear this on tape. All I can do is to warn you. All I can do is to say when the first nation goes down, if you have anything in the bank, get it out. Get it out. You people that are here right now, you say, my house isn't paid for. Don't worry about it. Don't fret about it. God said, my people are not going to have to beg for bread. There's going to be privation, but God's going to take care of those who hold Christ as the head. God's going to meet every need. There's going to be privation. There's going to be suffering. But God is going to shake everything that can be shaken. talking to God and said, Lord, and I've seen such, I've seen something coming that's so frightening I can't tell an audience. The Lord won't even let me go public with all of it. And I'm not trying to tantalize with it. 
All, all I know is I said, Lord, how can I believe what you're saying to my heart right now? How can I believe this? And God spoke to my heart. Would you have believed me in January if I told you the oil, it was $34 a barrel, was going down to $12? Would you have believed me? No. If I'd have told you that that satellite would blow up and a prophecy from the book of Acts would be fulfilled right to the letter, in the last days I'll show you signs in heaven, blood and fire and vapor smoke. And when it blew up, the blood of those seven astronauts mixed in that fire and three vapors of smoke. Did you see it? Blood and fire and vapors of smoke. Would you believe that that's a fulfillment? Would you believe it? Would you believe it? No. You'd better believe it now. If I had prophesied or anybody else had prophesied those things, I'd have been laughed and any other watchman in America would have been laughed out of existence. But now... The judgment, doesn't, it, it's not just earthquake, it's not famine, pestilence. This oil situation is in the hand of God. Down in Houston right now, it, it's, the, it's incredible what's happening down in Houston. Some, some churches down there feeding as many as 1,000 people now just coming for food. Jobs being lost left and right. The oil may come back maybe uh, for a while, but it's going to cause bankruptcies of nation after nation. They're going to fall like dominoes. And the church is not ready. God's people are not ready. And what blows my spiritual mind that here the enemy is at the gate, the Holy Ghost raising up watchmen and men of God who, who are seeking his face night and day. This message I received came after just being shut in with God night and day. And I'm not boasting. It just it didn't come out of my own heart. And I see it coming. And I cry because the church is not ready. The people are not ready. We're not ready to trust the Lord. We've talked about trusting in the Lord. But folks, we're going to lose a lot of things. We're going to be forced into trusting Him if we're not going to do it now. And what grieves me is that we still have evangelists building resorts. The enemy at the gate, and it's all coming down, and they're still begging and screaming for money. Send me money, money, money. Build my dream. It's abomination in the sight of Almighty God. Pastors, why aren't you standing up and crying out against it in your pulpits? Why aren't you telling your people you're going to be a partaker of their sins if you send a dime? God's going to terrorize this nation. He said 1,000 will flee at the threat of one man. You shall flee at the threat of five until you are left as a flag on a mountain top and as a signal on a mountain. He said, you're just going to be a shell of what you once were. Just going to be a testimony to what you were. Just, just a flagpole, not even a flag. God said, I'm going to terrorize the nation. You're going to be only a shadow of what you once were. The kingdom of self and pride and ambition is coming down. The warnings of Isaiah will not be heeded. My warnings will be scoffed at. And when it comes, and it will come, what good are all those messages of prosperity going to be then? What are these men going to preach then? When it all comes down around us. When it comes down. If you and I knew how soon it was, we'd be on our face tonight. We'd be on our face and, oh God, do I have what it takes to see me through? Now, God's preparing a people, not a people to run and hide, not a people in fear, because there's a good part of this, and I'm going to get into it in just a minute, a glorious part. But you're going to see in about a three-month time, major ministries all over America come tumbling down within three months. They're all going down except a few who are preaching repentance with men who are walking in righteousness and are not robbing the poor. You know what God's been telling our ministry? Sell everything you can. Give it away. Curb your lifestyle. Don't spend money for anything now except is what is absolutely necessary. You've got an old car, thank God for it. Don't buy a new one. You got a mortgage on the house? Fine. Commit it to the Lord. Say, Lord, it's yours. If I have to live in a tent, you'll be with me. I, I lived to see the day when I was a teenager when there were over 105 great healing ministries in America. Huge tents, men riding jets, 
two and three hundred workers, huge tents, huge trucks were going up and down the land, huge heating meetings. Many of them were men of God. But all much of it got into the flesh. Filth, running after money and women. And I lived to see the day God took it all down. One of the great men of God that I admired the most, one of the best preachers among them, lives in his car now. He's 72 years old and he has the shakes. He curses God and he lives in his car. Another, who is one of the third leading healing evangelists when I was a teenager, as a night watchman in a hospital down in Miami. Many of them died as drunkards. One is a homosexual. And I, I lived to see the day God took it all down. I worked with Catherine Coleman for five years, and she said, David, when I'm gone, I'm the last. I'm the last. And she was a woman of God, a great woman of God. She said, when I'm gone, David, that's the last of the great so-called healing evangelist. It's a whole new realm. God's going to do it with individualism. He's going to raise up a body. The healing belongs to the church. It's going back to the church. And we're going to see the day now soon. It's coming that ministries start tumbling left and right and God's going to purify his body. He's got to shut off all of these voices before he can get his true word into the hearts of this people. I, I, I'm trembling here tonight because I, I know that this is going to go out now and people say David has certainly had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> is, is Isaiah lying? Listen to him. A collapse is coming suddenly in an instant, and whose collapse is like the smashing of a potter's jar, ruthlessly shatter, ruthlessly. God is going to ruthlessly shatter every ministry of the flesh. It's going down. Oh, there'll be others in the flesh. There'll be others rise in their place. Yes. But Paul said, whose mouths need to be stopped, and God's going to stop it. I, I can't tell you anymore. I'm going to move on. I just maybe just don't have the, the courage yet. But all I'm going to tell you, folks, we are on the brink now of what God's been saying to this nation, that he's getting his house in order. And you'd better be where he can talk to you. You better not be going down toward Egypt. You better not be in the wilderness headed for Egypt. You'd better be holding the head. Now, you want the good part? It's a little heavy here tonight. I better get into this good part real quick. All right, here's the good part. Look at me. Don't, don't go over there yet. Just look here. All right, here it is. Out of this apostate thing, God is going to raise up a holy, repentant people who are going to yearn after him. Oh, how the Lord has been longing for a people who long for Him. God's been grieving over this apostate thing that's arising in the land. And out of His compassionate heart, now He's going to have a people after Himself. Hallelujah. Go to verse 18. Chapter 30, verse 18, Isaiah. Therefore, He's talking now about a people He's going to raise up. He's changed this too. Now you see, He said, as far as I'm concerned, that apostate thing is dead. It's already ruthlessly shattered, and God's already said it's out of, out of the... It's already gone, and now He's talking to His bridehood. Now He's talking to a people who are going all the way with Him and hold their head. Therefore, the Lord longs to what? Be gracious to you. And therefore, He waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for Him. Now, Isaiah was dressing... Now, people of the future, he's speaking to people who are going to be a Zion Jerusalem, a spiritual Zion Jerusalem, a people who will never collapse. And the thing that's going to characterize this holy remnant is that they have yearning hearts for the Lord, whose hearts long for Him. Now, what was the mark of the apostate people? They yearned for Egypt. But these people yearn for the heart of Christ. They long for the Lord. Now, that's the sad lack in the church. There's so little yearning for Jesus Christ, so little yearning for the Lord. People will witness for Him. They'll, they'll feed the poor. They'll, they'll march for abortion. They'll march for any kind of cause, but it lacks the yearning for the heart of God. 
God said in Jeremiah 2.32, My people forgot me days without number. Look at verse 19. While all around there's a collapse and a ruthless shaking, it says, Oh, people in Zion. See, these are the people now in Zion. Where is Zion? That's in the heart of Jesus. Oh, you people in Zion, inhabitant of Jerusalem, you will weep no longer. He will surely be gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. Now, I'm going to show you where the prophet Isaiah said, in this time of shaking, there are going to be privations. There's going to be an oppression from Satan, from the world, and from circumstances. But God, in the midst of this privation, is going to manifest himself. Look at verse 20. Although the Lord has given you bread of privation and water of oppression, he, your teacher, will no longer hide himself, but your eyes will behold your teacher. There's coming forth a pure, crystal clear word of God. A holy, pure word's going to come forth. It's already coming forth. Hallelujah. In all my lifetime, I've never heard such clear word coming from some men of God who've been shut in between the porch and the altar, weeping over the sins and the abominations of the land. Those who come out of the secret closet. I've been hearing a pure word and it thrills my heart. Glory to God. Your teacher's not going to hide anymore. And he said, I'm not going to hide the word from you anymore. I'm going to tell you something else, folks. Hear me good. If you go to a dead, dry church, you've got a bunch of praying people in there. The first thing you do, you get praying and get fired up for God. And I'm going to be speaking about that tomorrow night when I talk about the resurrection realm. New realm that he's going to bring his, he's bringing his people into, into realm of resurrection. And the first thing you do when you get on fire for God is the church is going to call you crazy. The rest of the people, they're going to ostracize you, think you've gone nuts. Why? Because you're seeking the Lord with all your heart. You're not playing games anymore. You Go ahead and get rid of your television and see how many people laugh at you. Our whole staff gathered up $15,000 worth and we shot them with shotguns and everybody laughed at us. Somebody said, sell them. I don't sell idols. And don't tell me it's, an I it's not an idol. Why is all the furniture facing it? You've got a pastor that's not seeking God. Love him. Pray that God will wake him up. And if he's going to go the other way, pray him out. Pray him out. He said, I'll give you a shepherd after my own heart. I said, pray him out. First, pray him to his knees. Be patient and love him. But then if he hardens his heart and you hear an uncertain sound... Pray him into a congregation that wants to hear that kind. And ask God to give you a shepherd after his heart, and he'll do it. If there are enough people in that congregation, God will answer that prayer. And I know I'm going to get a lot of flack on that. Look at verse 21. And your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right or turn to the left. These people are not going to be confused or burned out, are they? They're going to hear a word, a pure word. This is the way. Walk in it. Glory to God. Something else they're going to do. They're going to tear down all their idols. Look at verse 22. And you will defile your graven images overlaid with silver and your molten images plated with gold. You will scatter them as an impure thing and say to them, Be gone! Be gone! <laughs> I got a whole message on that. <laughs> They're going to tear down every idol. They're going to say, I can't stand before a holy God with these idols anymore. Be gone. That's enough. Be gone. Hey, wh what in the world is so difficult about getting that idol out of your house? What is it that's holding you? Come on. What is it? Give me one Holy Ghost reason. <laughs> but it's not just that idol. It's all idolatry. All of it. Some of you have a pornographic refrigerator. <clears throat> You're so in love with food. You... 
It's an idol. I want to tell you, boy, I keep saying I want to tell you. That's Bob, help me with that, Don. I've got to quit saying that. Let me say this. <coughs> <laughs> In the middle of this collapse, when everything is going to be shaken and be shaken, do you really believe God means it when He says everything can be shaken is going to be shaken? Do you really believe that? Oh, we shall see. Everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. But during that shaking, these people are coming under the pure word of God, holding Christ as the head, knocking down all their idols, going all the way with the Lord in His righteousness. And I'm talking about a righteousness by faith. His righteousness worked out in a practical way in our lives, even though it's His righteousness, not ours, not by works, but by faith, but worked out in a practical way in our lives. Those people are going to have the greatest ministry they've ever had during this time. I'm going to prove it to you. Verse 23, then he will give you, he's talking about this Zion people, then he will give you rain for the seed which you sow in the ground, that's the message you're preaching, and bread from the yield of the ground, and it will be rich and plenteous. On that day your livestock will graze in a roomy pasture. Oh, hallelujah. Almost wish, makes you want to wish it was right here, doesn't it? This yearning remnant going to have a glorious harvest during a day of ruin and calamity. They're not going to be running. They won't be hiding. They've heard the sound of the trumpet and they've prepared. They've hid themselves in Christ in the cleft of the rock. They're not going to burn out. They're not going to be discouraged. They're not going to be cast down. There'll be no confusion in them. They will know God has prepared them for this hour. They're going to be drinking from a divine spring of water. Look at verse 25. And on every lofty mountain, on every high hill, there will be streams running with water on the day of the great slaughter when the towers fall. When God brings down all these strong towers of ministries, when He's slaughtering everything in sight that's of the flesh, He's going to cause a stream of water to flow from His throne and the remnant bride are going to drink from it. Living waters. Hmm. There'd be streams running with water. Best of all, these bruised but believing saints are going to have the greatest revelation of Jesus the world has ever had. Do you know that we're seeing things that prophets wanted and longed to see and they couldn't see and we've been able to see it? Do you know that the Bible proves that when everything's being shattered, there are going to be a people who see it seven times brighter? Look, look at verse 26. And the light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be what? Seven times brighter. That doesn't mean there's going to be something revealed that's not already there. It's always been there. Not some new word. It's just going to be that God going to open it seven times greater than it's ever been opened before. And He's doing that now. And God not, doesn't want that just for a few pastors or a few missionaries or anything else. He wants praying people who go in and they come to the house of God. There should be a body right now that's seeing what God is saying to His church. People who say, I see something fresh and new about Jesus. Glory to God. And the light of seven days on the day of the Lord binds up the fracture of His people and heals the bruise He has inflicted. Oh, hallelujah. I almost feel like going into my next one, the resurrection realm, but I'll wait till tomorrow night. <laughs> hallelujah. I'm not afraid. I've got joy in my heart because I, I feel that finally the time has come. I've prayed for years and years. Lord, when do you start bringing all this thing down? When do you start getting a hold of people's attention? Well, it's coming, folks. We're, we're at the, it's at the door. The enemy's at the gate. Ah, but the Lord is standing by, ready to... Do you know He's been preparing some of you? You've been in the fire? You've been tested? You've been thinking, am I crazy? Am I the only one? You ever felt alone? Am I the only one who feels alone anymore? Brother Warnick's been feeling alone up there in Canada for 40 years. But now he's not alone anymore. He's got some brothers around him who feel just like he does and seeing the same things. Hallelujah. 
Lord's had you in hiding, hasn't he? He's been testing and proving you. He's been preparing the people. He's been warning them. Get your house in order. Don't be afraid. And when it happened, you say, I knew it. I knew it. Nothing new. He said he doesn't do a thing until he warns his servants, the prophets. Now, I'm not a prophet, but I'm one of his many watchmen. Maybe one of the least, but one of his watchmen. And I stand here now. And I don't know what else I can say. When it comes, people say, why weren't we warned? They've been warned for 10, 20 years. Now it's all coming in. Hallelujah. And I've got a hope in me, abounding like I've never had, because the word is coming forth now without all the hype. It's coming forth now without all the entertainment. Folks, that's garbage and it's all over. It's a stench in God's nostril. And he said, enough, enough. It's all done. I've passed by that now. I'm preparing me a people. Hallelujah. A repentant, holy people. And I really believe the word's going to come forth so soon in this next, tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon. There's going to be a word of repentance come forth. But the word tonight is for us is this. That we have got to repent before we go any further in this conference and any further in this gathering. We have got to repent in our hearts honestly of anything that has to do with the flesh. Of being removed from that simple childlike faith and the headship and the all-inclusiveness of Jesus Christ is the answer to every need in our life. You teen challenge workers, that's the way you started. Don't you get off. Repent of everything. Get it all out. I, that's what I've been doing. I said, Jesus, and, and the last six months, that's all I've been doing. I've been cutting all the strings of the world, cutting all the strings of the flesh, asking God to burn it all out so that we're cast, absolutely cast onto Him. It's Jesus being everything. That nothing else matters. Are you, going to, are you going to hold on to that secret sin? Are you going to cling to that thing that's dragging you down? Are you going to let it go in this conference? Are you going to let it go and say, Jesus, I want you. With all my heart, I want you. I've never wanted him more than I do now. <clears throat> Suppose the reason I tremble when I preach this is tonight that I almost lost it. I almost went the way of the flesh. See, the way of the flesh includes crowds and money and prestige and honor. It has all of that connected with it. His way is a different way. His way is the way of the outcast, the rejected, the lonely. Those who are just looked down upon. If you're going to go this path, don't expect to be somebody. But it's going to be a holy people. Separated, sanctified. <clears throat> Every day now I lay on my face, I say, Jesus, I come to you, open my heart. Turn on the light. Show me anything now and burn it out. I lay it down to you, Jesus. I lay it down. Stand with me, please. <clears throat> I sense the Holy Spirit just moving in my heart now to ask you a simple, direct question. And that's all, just a simple, direct question. Are you, where, are, are you right now where you were when you loved Him the most? Do you remember the time you loved Him the most in your life? Are you there now? Do you love Him less? Do you trust Him less? I ask you a question. What would you do if you lost everything? You lost your ministry. You lost your paycheck. You lost everything you had. And you have nothing left but Him. Is that enough? Is that enough? It's going to come down to that. 
Paul said, I've suffered the loss of all things. I count the whole world as dung that I may win him. We've, we've had enough platitudes and cliches about how we trust Jesus. Now, God said, I'm going to prove you. I'm going to put you in circumstances where there's no other choice. No other choice. And I tell you something, you're not going to be able to just jump into that position. You're going to have to be ready. It's not just going to dawn on you suddenly. You better be trusting him now. You better be preparing in your heart right now. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. I just feel like worshiping Him a moment. Lord, we worship You. We praise You. We're not afraid. We sense You, Holy Spirit, saying to our hearts, come back to the head. Come back to the head. Come back to that simple faith in Christ as being all in all. The head of your ministry. The head of your life. Take all fear. Smite all fear, Lord Jesus. Break all the bonds to materialism. Break all the bonds to the flesh. Break it all, Lord. Hallelujah. I'll, I'll tell you something. Look at me, please. I'm, I'm doing something I didn't expect to do. And I feel so clear in the Holy Spirit to do it right now. Some of you that came here are backslidden. You're backslidden. That's right. It's not a matter of trusting the Lord. You've lost your confidence in Him. You're in this conference, this gathering, and you're cold and hard. You're cold. and You're almost dull. You say, I want to get back, but I can't. There's a dullness in me. And I sense that dullness, and I believe I'm speaking in the Spirit right now. And He's ministering in the Spirit. There's a dullness that the devil himself has put on you. And the Bible says, shake yourself. I want you to get out of your seat and come here and I want to lay hands on you. I'm going to ask the brethren to join me over here, my associates, and I'm going to ask God to bind that spirit and take it out. Otherwise, this gathering is not going to do anything for you. Nothing's going to happen until that dullness is gone. That spiritual dullness, that emptiness. Move in closer, please. <clears throat> oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. That dullness, Lord. The devil trying to destroy the ministry, trying to destroy that usefulness. You that are standing, look up here. Now, many of you are in parachurch ministries. We've got a lot of youth pastors here, and and I I, I want to move in the spirit, but I sense that. Some of you have actually been in a spirit of seduction of the enemy where he's trying to get you to back to your old life. Some of you were delivered before you entered this ministry that God's given to you. You were on drugs or alcohol. And all over the country, I see them going down left and right. Ministers going down into deep sin. And I don't know how else to do this. And I'm not putting on a show, but it's life and death. I want to know how many of you are standing up here right now that Satan has tried to put thoughts in your mind to go back and give up. Raise your hand. 
Mm. Furthermore, and I'm not going to belabor it, and I'm not going to go any further, but some of you have already gone back. You're doing things now that grieve the Holy Ghost, and you know it. Deeply grieved. I'm working with some workers now that say, David, even though I ministered for four years, I was going out and doing a little drugs and drinking on the side. Be surprised how many preachers are watching pornographic materials on cassettes, filled in their minds with filth. And the Lord wants to cleanse and purge tonight. Jesus, minister, oh God, break that spirit. Break it now. Break it. Jesus, restore this spirit. Restore. Both of you, put your hands up. Both of you, Lord Jesus, a restoration right now. A restoration of the Holy Ghost in this heart. The binding of all the pits of darkness and hell. <clears throat> Audience, I want you to join me. I, uh, many of these that are up here, and I, I, I know that some of your pastors are up here, but many of you that are up here have been working with other people. That, brother, right here. Come here just a moment. What ministry are you with? Where at? Midland, Texas. Midland, Texas. The devil's just been trying to tear you apart. Raise both hands. Jesus. Oh, oh Satan, you're a liar. Release him. Go. Go. He's going to hold you, brother. He's holding you. He's holding you in his hands. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All of you that are up here, look at me right now. I have a word for you and I want you to listen. The Lord's not angry at any one of you. He's not mad at you. He's not mad at you. If your heart's open, He's not going to let you carry this burden another moment. He will set you free and bring to your heart a spirit of rejoicing. But there's got to be willingness in your heart to say, Oh God, I failed you. I acknowledge my failure. I've not been seeking your face. I've been into the flesh. I've been down to Egypt. I've not been trusting you, Jesus, with all my heart. Oh, God, you've got your hand in. You, you've got her in your hand, Jesus. Lift up your hands. He's not going to let you go. He'll not let you go. He will not let you go. Audience, would you join me in prayer for all these? You that are here, raise both hands right now. Right now, Jesus, I confess right now. I've been walking in the flesh. I confess right now, Jesus. I've been walking in flesh. My God. God, I bind Satan in Jesus' name. This is a servant of the Most High God. This is a servant of the Most High God. Satan, you're a liar. Let the heart go out, Jesus. Let the heart go out. Reach out your heart to him right now. My heart goes out to you, Jesus. Come, Redeemer. Come, blessed Redeemer. Come, blessed Redeemer, now restore the joy of the Lord to my heart. Restore the joy of the Lord to my heart. Restore the joy of the Lord to my heart. Take the dryness, the dullness from me. Restore the joy of the Lord to my heart. Jesus. <laughs> oh, my brother, my brother. That's God. He's seen your cry. He's heard your cry. He's heard your cry. Jesus, you've heard the cry. Brother, he's heard your burdened heart. Lord Jesus, you've seen the hunger and the thirst and how Satan has tried to rob him of that anointing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Audience, would you just lift both hands for a moment? Let's just lift our hands to him while we pray. Lord Jesus, Satan would try to rob the servants of the Most High God to rob them, destroy them. We come against Satan in Jesus' name. We come against every power of darkness. Release people tonight. Release them from this bondage of sin, this bondage of doubt, this bondage of fear. Lord, bring us back to the head. Bring us back to you, Jesus, to the head. Bring us back to the head. Oh, God, we repent before you tonight. We come, Jesus, now asking you to touch us. We ask you to touch us, oh, Lord. Holy Ghost, break through upon us break through upon us. Break through upon us.
I'll, I'll, there's, there, there's, there's someone standing up here right now, and I don't know who you may be, but before you came here tonight, you're on the verge of just quitting. The devil's told you it's no use to just quit. You were going to quit unless God did something for you. I want this audience to hear your cry so we can pray with you. Would you just come up and share with me right now? You said, David, I was going to quit. I've just, I've just been so defeated by Satan. And so absolutely just torn. Brother, where are you from? What ministry? Pastor. What church? Parkdale Assembly of God in Beaumont, Texas. Take the line. Why did you have to call him? Hold it closer. Lord, the anointing has come to break the yoke. A year ago, I was pastoring a very a very spiritual church that we had pioneered in another city, and I was preaching the word as best I knew and praying and fasting, and God was doing a wonderful thing, and the Lord asked me to leave that, so I was obedient, and I did, and I went to a church. And I continued to preach the same way I had in a church I had pioneered. And the spirit of lawlessness rose up so violently. And for the first time in 14 years, I submitted to the fear of man. For five months... I've gotten away from my prayer time and my quiet time and my fasting. When God called me to the ministry, I was destined to be a professional golfer. I was headed that way. I'd given my life to that particular profession and Two weeks ago, for the first time in 14 years, I said, I'm going to get out of the ministry. Hmm. And I'm going to get back into what I know I can do. Back to I know I can be successful. Go back to Egypt. Hmm. About a month ago, I got your, your letter. And I kept it on my desk for a month. And I threw it in the trash three days ago. Mm. And I decided that Egypt's not worth it. I told my wife, who's also at the same, or was at the same point that I was, of just throwing in the towel. I said, baby, I said, if we lose everything... You see, when you preach against the spirit of lawlessness, people stop paying their tithes. They pass petitions to get you out of their church. I said, baby, I said, if we lose our home, our car, everything we have, I said, if we lose it all, it'll be worth just having Jesus. Brother David, I too started on the streets preaching and I'm willing to go back. <clears throat> the devil fought us all the way up here yep. with car problems. I want you to see Dawn right after service. 
That's what we've been praying about. The devil fought us all the way here. When we hit Dallas, we had an associate that used to work with us that's in Tioga, and we left our children there. We decided to come not even a day before. We just left. And when we hit Dallas, going up to Tioga to leave our children and come back, our car started dying. It died, it died, it died. And I recognized that it was the devil. That's right. I said, I'll not submit to this. And every time I stopped, my car's died. And I've had to put it in neutral and rev that baby up and throw it in drive and screech the tires and keep coming. And I said, I'm going to go. Because two days ago, the Lord said, you go, you go. I love the Lord tonight. And I thank him for now, his presence. I pray for you now, Jesus. You honor this step. And you, you bring such a life to him now. A repentance that produces life. And give him a people, Lord, that will hear your word. Give him a people if it has to go out in the street, Lord. Give him a people. Give him a people, Lord. He's got a shepherd's heart now, Lord. A true shepherd's heart. You've cleansed. You've purged. Thank you, Jesus. Beautiful, brother. God bless your heart. God bless your heart. Hallelujah. 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 What ministry are you with? Um, I just work in a factory. Uh-huh. Uh, well, the Lord me to share my Not right now. Maybe, maybe before the service. We're going to have testimony last night. That's as far as I want to go tonight. Uh, see, this is what I'm, I'm saying. G God's trying in gatherings like this to restore the strength and the power of the Holy Ghost in your ministry and your life. A heart pure before God. And I'll tell you, the word that's coming forth in this next few days is going to revolutionize you. you will ne I promise you will never be the same. Brother Bob, the word, it's all cut out for you. Tomorrow and Brother Warnock and Don, God's, God's preparing a word for this people because there's hunger. God promises there's going to be great healing. Are you, is that husband and wife? What ministry are you with? Okay, both of you give me a hand. Lord Jesus, in this gathering, let there be such renewal, such an anointing of your Holy Spirit and a calling away from the world. Lord, life-changing, life-changing. Hallelujah. Uh, Big John, come on, join me here. Amen. We never close unless we got some singing and shouting, praising the Lord. In every one of these meetings, glory to God. How many believe the Lord's here? Well, hey, uh, what are we going to sing, John? I mean, I, I just feel like rejoicing right now. I feel like rejoicing. And how many believe the Lord's answering your prayer here right now? No, the work's not finished, but he's begun to work. He's begun to work. He's just begun. I tell you, by Friday night, though, you're going to know he's done a deep work in your heart. You will know it. The word will keep coming and coming and coming and digging and digging. And then start blessing you like you've never been blessed in your lifetime. Pastor, if you're here, just hold steady. Please don't judge it till it's over. And then do all the judging you want. But God's going to do a supernatural work in many, many hearts. All right.